Hello friends, hi. Welcome to Doc Moe and Friends and Crush Course AFP. So today we're going to be talking about the clinical interview. So this is one of the things that I think candidates find uh, one of the scariest parts of the application process, but there really is no need because you've already got all of the knowledge that you need to succeed in this bit. It's all about just having a good structure and confidence to communicate this with the examiners. Okay, so we're going to go straight into it. The structure of the video is as follows. We're going to go over the structure of the interview. Now, a lot of places make you sign non-disclosure agreements. Oh my God, there's a plane. Now, a lot of the places that you go to to do interviews make you sign a non-disclosure agreement. So um, I don't want to do anything illegal in this video. So we're going to be covering information that's out there in the public domain, but I'll include some links to forums below. And then we're going to talk about what they're looking for in an applicant who's going to these interviews. Then we'll move on to what the preparation material is um, and what I found useful when I was preparing for these interviews, where I got all of my content from. And then we'll move on to the bulk of this video um, where we'll be talking about the structure for dealing with sick patients and how you will answer the questions that come up in the interview. And then we'll go over the strategies for preparation, okay, how you should go about doing it in my opinion. And finally, we'll start to talk about the tips and tricks that uh, I found quite useful when I was preparing for the clinical interview as part of the AFP. Okay, so first things first, the structure of the interview. Okay, so it can vary from place to place. In London, it's quite well signposted, it's quite straightforward. You get given 10 minutes with an interview panel and you get given two, three, maybe four cases to go through, but that's it. You'll be given them on a single sheet of A4 paper and you will be expected to uh, go into the room and answer a question such as how would you proceed or which patient would you go to see first? And then you'll go and talk through your A to E approach and then move on from there. In other places, it's uh, slightly different. So you might have in some places a single case, but that has multiple elements to it. Um, and you might get probed about the management of that condition and then subsequent long-term management and the biopsychosocial model of uh, attending to that patient. So it's a more holistic overview of the patient. And then finally, you might just get asked academic questions, almost as if you're being vivid in a PACES style exam. I won't spend any more time talking about this sort of stuff because this information is readily available online elsewhere. Okay, so what are they looking for in someone who's going to interview um, and do the clinical interview as part of the AFP process? Okay, the overarching theme is they're looking for someone who's safe, okay? As an F1, you're not going to be able to manage patients completely on your own. You need to be able to recognize a sick patient, start the initial management, and then escalate to seniors where appropriate. So the first thing you need to be is safe. The next thing you need to be able to do is prioritize seeing patients based on necessity, okay? So in my opinion, the A2A approach provides you with all the tools to be able to do this, and we'll talk more about this later, but you need to be able to recognize who's the sickest patient and who needs to be seen first. Next up, they're looking for someone who's got the knowledge. So it's not enough for you to just be able to sit there in a written exam and take your time in recording the knowledge. You need to have the knowledge to manage all of the common emergency conditions, uh, the initial management at least, on your own, and it should be right there at the front of your mind. You should be able to recall it really quickly and then communicate concisely to an examiner um, your thoughts and your management. The next thing that they're looking for is for someone who's systematic, okay? So um, they don't want someone who uh, jumps from thought to thought when they're confronted with a sick patient. And the reason why is they don't want someone who jumps from thought to thought and, and, and loses their call when they're confronted with a patient who looks quite sick, okay? It's really easy when you're in med school to get into EMQ mentality, where you think, oh, a diabetic patient from Southeast Asia um, with chest pain, it must be an MI. Well, no, you need to be able to rule out the other causes of chest pain as well. You need to be able to consider a pneumothorax, um, consider a PE. And I think the best way that you can be systematic about it is just stick to that A to E approach, which we're going to go through in super detail in this video. So just bear with us before we get to that part. And then finally, they're looking for someone who's versatile, okay? So when you're going through your A to E approach, something might happen, the patient might suddenly deteriorate or arrest, and they might say this in the interview to you. And you need to be able to then adapt and then respond appropriately um, to new information about the patient, a new scenario. Um, and you need to be able to do this quite calmly and confidently. You need to be someone who's quite versatile. Okay, so the next part of this video is about the preparation material that I found helpful when I was preparing for the clinical part of the AFP interview process. Um, there are lots of different sources of information and you can go about it however you like. 
However, I think most of the information, if not all of the information that you need to succeed in this interview is in the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine in the emergency section. Okay, so I think the first thing to bear in mind is when your finals are in final year. So um, for me, as I went to Imperial, my finals were in the end of March, beginning of April time, and the interviews were end of November, beginning of December. Um, so there was you know, a, a large period of time and I hadn't really started revising for my finals exams yet. I think that puts you slightly at a disadvantage and you need to work really hard to get on top of things before you're really supposed to in final year. But if, you, if you're thinking that it might be difficult to fit the interviews in alongside your finals exams, actually I think that um, this shouldn't be a deterrent to you applying. It will mean that you do very well because all of that knowledge is fresh in your mind. What some people also like to do is they like to go over the BLS and the ILS algorithms if you've done um, that. I think ALS is a little bit too advanced maybe for the interview. You probably won't need all of that information, but I think definitely if you've done ILS, if you've done BLS, make sure you've got that algorithm to hand. And then I think finally, some of the people kind of use older years notes and they use notes on general internal medicine. And that's fair enough, but I think that you don't need all of that knowledge um, to succeed in this interview. Of course, you're going to need all of this knowledge um, before you graduate in order to pass finals. But I think for the purpose of the interview, you won't need to go into that much detail, and that much breadth. I think the focus should be on your ability to manage emergencies confidently and to be able to talk through the investigations and management of sick patients with great confidence to an interviewer who's going to be really mean to you. Okay, so now for the meat of this video. We're going to cover in detail and actually quite slowly the A to E assessment of sick patients. So the A to E assessment is obviously not something that I've come up with. Um, it's something that exists in the literature and it's obviously very widely used. Um, however, there are some things that I've included that have helped make it easier for me to remember certain elements. So particularly for breathing and circulation, there's a lot that you need to do and it's easy to forget certain components. So we'll cover that in detail in a second. Okay, firstly, A. A stands for airway. And what you need to make sure is that the airway is patent. If you're concerned about the airway, escalate it to someone above you, so an SHR registrar. Ideally, you want to think about getting anesthetic support in uh, quite early as well and then start the simple airway maneuvers, such as a head tilt and chin lift, and think about airway adjuncts as well. Okay, B. Now B stands for breathing. There's lots of stuff you can do as part of B and C, as I said earlier, and what I like to do is remember them by the golden five. Observations, the peripheral exam, the central exam, investigations that you're going to do immediately, and then the initial management of this sick patient. Okay, let's go through this for B. So B. The observations that are going to be relevant are going to be respiratory rate and SATs rate. And if you're concerned, we'll do the investigations relevant to B. Next up, start with the peripheral exam. Now, we are not doing a full respiratory exam. All you're going to do is peripherally start off and have a look. Is this patient cyanosed? Then move centrally to the mouth. Is there evidence of cyanosis there? Come down. Check the trachea to make sure it's central and non-deviated, and then have a look at the chest. What's it look like in terms of symmetry? What's it look like in terms of chest movements? Is the patient any obvious signs of respiratory distress? And then finally, have a quick listen to the chest. That's basically it for breathing, okay, in terms of the observations, the peripheral exam and the central exam. The next thing you need to think about doing are the investigations. Now, it's quite straightforward for breathing. If you're concerned that the SATs are low or that the respirate is high, consider doing an ABG, okay? That will give you more information about the oxygenation status and the acid base balance of this patient. And next up, you can think about doing a chest x-ray. So request a chest x-ray if you're concerned about breathing. And if you're really concerned, you can even get a portable one so that it's done quicker. Okay, and then finally, you're gonna move on to that management, which is the fifth part of the golden five. And for breathing, the management is relatively straightforward. Put them on oxygen if they're hypoxic and you're not concerned about that target range that you use in CO2 retainers, which is 88 to 92%. And then you're gonna start thinking about targeted therapy. Now, the targeted therapy is going to come from your revision from the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine's emergency section. So for asthma, you'll start them on nebulizers. For uh, infective processes, you might put them on antibiotics. But the management is going to be specific to what you think is going on okay if you are happy with B then you can consider moving on to C I think this is really important to reiterate only move on to the next section of the A to E assessment if you are happy with the current section and if you have put in a new management so if you started the patient on oxygen you need to go back to a, you need to go back to you need to go back to A and reassess A and B to see whether the management has had an effect there's another plane coming
Okay, so you're happy with B, let's move on to C now. So with C, it's the same golden five thing that we're going to do. So with the observations, what you want to be looking for is heart rate, blood pressure, and I like to include temperature as well, because with sepsis, you can result in massive circulatory collapse quite quickly. And I also like to include just a quick look at fluid balance. Have a look what's gone in and what's gone out in the past day or two to get an idea of the patient's fluid balance. And then you move on to the peripheral exam. So peripherally, what you're going to do is you're going to assess for cap refill in the fingers. You're then going to have a quick feel. Are they warm and well perfused peripherally? And then go to the radial... <laughs> I give up. Shall we pause? <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so you've done your OBS. Next up, we're gonna do the peripheral examination. Again, this isn't a thorough cardio exam. This is a focused cardio exam. Basically, all you wanna check is that the cap refill time peripherally is under two seconds. And then you're also gonna have a quick feel to see that they've got warm peripheries that are well perfused and then have a feel of the radial pulses as well bilaterally and assess the character of the pulses um, in both radii. So working your way up, you're gonna now start centrally. So have a quick look inside the mouth. Have they got moist mucous membranes? And then come down to the chest and have a feel of central cap refill time as well. Finally, just have a quick listen of the heart sounds, just make sure that they're normal. Um, and then that's basically your C assessment done. Okay, so what are the investigations that we're going to do as part of C? Well, there's only really a few. The first one and the most obvious one is bloods, and you need to be able to justify all of your blood tests to the examiner opposite you, okay? So of course you're gonna do a full blood count, of course you're gonna do use and ease, but if the patient's bleeding, you wanna add on top of that group and save and cross match. If you're worried about sepsis, then you can think about doing blood cultures as well as doing a VBG or an ABG for lactate. You can also think about doing an ECG if you're concerned about the patient's heart. Finally, if you haven't already done it at this point, it's probably worth doing a chest X-ray um, if you're worried about heart failure or volume overload. Okay, so we've done those four things. The final thing in, as part of C is the management. So the management, again, is going to be highly dependent on um, the knowledge that you will have gained as part of revising the emergency section of the Oxford Handbook. But you need to make sure that you've got all of the key doses there in your mind so that you can roll it off the tip of your tongue as you're doing the interview. It'll make you sound really confident and really slick if you can come up with the doses of common drugs. And you need to be able to confidently and quickly come up with the management plan um, for all the common conditions. So you need to know that for something like heart failure, you want to sit the patient up, give them some oxygen, you know, a bit of fruzamide and also some morphine as well. And you need to be aware of this. And now the plane is back. Okay, so that's C done. For D, it's really straightforward. It's just the triple D, okay? So first of all, do a quick assessment of their consciousness. So you can either use GCS or APU. And if you're unsure what either of those acronyms mean, just have a quick Google search and make sure that you know what they are. Okay, and then you move on to pupils. Just make sure that pupils are equal and reactive to light. And then finally, as part of D, don't ever forget glucose, okay? Make sure you do a BM. You'd be surprised how many times you could have a drowsy or unconscious patient and it's just because they've got low blood sugars. Okay, and then we've moved on from D. We're gonna move on to E if you're happy with that. Realistically, as part of the interviews, you're probably not gonna get round to doing this or you'll have been interrupted by this point by the examiner. E is just a top to toe examination of the patient and you can include doing the abdomen as well. Okay, so we've covered the A to E assessment. I'm just gonna go over again a couple of the key things you need to be aware of when you're using A to E. Number one, don't just roll straight through A to E and then assume that you've done your job. You need to tell the examiner that between each section, if you're not happy, you need to do something about that section. So if you're not happy with B, you need to start doing management as part of B. Only when you're happy do you move on. The second thing is if you have done a change in management, you need to go back to the top and reassess. You want to make sure that you're treating the patient and that what you're doing is working for the patient. The next thing, and I think this is often overlooked, is that you can use the A to E assessment method to triage and assess patients in terms of how sick they are. For example, if you've got a patient uh, who clearly has an airway problem, this is going to trump a patient that's got a breathing or a circulatory problem. And you can use this to your advantage, especially during the London interview, where you're given a number of patients and then you need to justify which patient you're going to go and see first. So I would recommend that you use the A to E method to triage the patients and then also to justify and verbalize this to the interviewer um, as you're thinking through it. 
The only thing that I would say about using this A to E method to triage patients is you need to be quite confident in your ability to determine which letter you'd allocate to each patient. So for example, one of the easiest traps to fall into is say, for example, there's a patient who's having a seizure. You could put that under D, but this would be wrong because actually seizures can result in compromise of the airways. So this immediately becomes an airway problem. So just be aware of that. Just have, have a think about what the worst possible situation could be for the patient that you get told about um, and then work from there. Okay, and finally, and most importantly, you need to be aware that you are an F1 in all of these circumstances. So you are going to be expected to escalate appropriately to seniors. So you need to get in contact with the SHO. You need to get in contact with your registrar. Um, it's not a one person job. Uh, you need to make sure that you involve other members of the team. And there will be points for this in the interview as well, where you acknowledge um, the role of the whole team around you. It's not just you on your own in the hospital. There are others there as well. Okay, so we've spoken about how you're going to answer the questions. We've spoken about where you're going to get the knowledge from. How are you actually going to prepare for this uh, station now that you've got all of that information? Okay, I think the most important bit of advice that I can give you at this stage is find a buddy. And you need to find a buddy that you're confident in and that you're happy working with for a prolonged period of time. The reason why is because this is ultimately a performance and it's a performance of how much knowledge you have. And you're not going to be able to accurately ascertain how well you're going to do until you've had a chance to practice with a friend regularly. What I'd recommend is if you know someone who's applying for AFP and you're good friends with them, just buddy up and then you guys can work together um, as you lead up towards the interview. So that's the most important thing, make sure you buddy up. Okay, so the next thing is make sure that you come up with a schedule um, and make sure you stick to it as well. So I would recommend one, maybe two times a week for about six weeks prior to the interviews is probably enough. You need to make sure that you do stick to that though, because you're going to need as much practice as possible before you go into the interview. I'd also recommend trying to make these sessions fun. So what I did with my friends is that we rotated between coffee shops and then um, going around to each other's houses. That way it means that you don't become bored of meeting up and, and doing preparation. So that's the next thing I'd recommend. And also make sure that you've prepared some material in, in advance. Uh, what I mean by this is that we would bring along a couple of cases that we prepared each to these sessions alongside some suggested mark schemes. And I think that that's quite important because it means that you don't just go along for a chat, but that you go along to, to get something out of it and that you learn something. The final thing that I'd recommend is just make sure that you show your buddy some tough love, okay? Because ultimately, you don't want to hear all the fluffy stuff. You don't want to hear how well you're doing. You need to know how badly you're doing and how you can change that in the best possible way. Ultimately, you're going to get grizzled. Grizzled? No, grilled. Ultimately, in the interview, you might get grilled by a really mean examiner. And it's nice for your friend to have been the first mean examiner and to have identified your weaknesses. And then you can work on that before you get to the interview stage. I think the other thing to bear in mind is that you need to be willing to accept criticism and don't feel personally offended by it because that's the only way that you're going to grow and you're going to be able to develop and then ace this interview moving forward. All right, finally, just some tips to bear in mind before you go into the interview. Um, so the first tip that I'd recommend, um, just bearing in mind before you go into the interviews, is that there are things that can happen before you go and see each patient. Just to give you an example maybe. Um, so say you've got one of the patients who's quite sick, has got anaphylaxis or what sounds like anaphylaxis, so that's an airway problem. Um, and then the second patient, let's say, is an exacerbation of asthma, um, which is obviously quite serious as well, but remember A trumps B. You can then turn around to the examiner and say, I would go and see the patient with the airway problem first because this is more acutely life-threatening. However, I would call the nurses for the second patient, make sure that they do a fresh set of OBS, prepare the notes, and then maybe start them on some oxygen and some NEBS as well. The second thing is that just remember that this is still an interview, okay? So no looking at your hands, no looking at the sky when you're trying to recall information. Look the interviewer dead in the eye, show them the confidence, show them that you've got the knowledge there, and that's why it's important to practice with someone before you go into the interview. So that's gonna be my third most important tip. Make sure you're preparing for the interview by practicing, looking someone in the eye and presenting to them regularly. That's the only way that you're going to develop the confidence to be able to ace this interview. And then finally, please, please, please remember that the A2E assessment is not something that you just steamroll straight through. You need to stop, you need to reassess, you need to make sure you're happy before you move on to each step. And whenever you do something, whenever you make a change in the management, go back and reassess the whole thing, okay? It is a tool that you use to uh, assess sick patients and then commence initial management. And then remember that you use that then to do the first steps before you escalate to a senior. Okay, thank you very much. I hope that video was informative. Um, if you think that I've missed something out, please leave it in the comments below. And until next time. That's it.